we want to make sure that it doesn't even just come down to does the person have like a hit? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's more mm-hmm. about does the person have the longevity that they want to be in it? You know, and, and that those are the kinds of things we try to determine when not just working on with a new artist based on like, look, let me see your pipeline revenue from Spotify or whatever, just to determine, you know, is this a one-time thing or are you, are you working? Mm -hmm. Um, All the way down to, you know, like, is, is this person coming in? uh, Who who are the kind of people that come in the room with this person? Is it, Mm -hmm. is it his team? Is it like videographer, manager? Is it all these people? Or is it just like, you know, a bunch of his friends? Like I want to see, how serious is this person? Because I need to make sure if we're going to be investing in something together that, you know, that person's head in, is in the game. And mm-hmm. I think that's the one defining factor that a lot of people try to kind of shy away from, but it's very much real as it's like, what's the character buildup of the person kind of coming into the room? Like, are mm-hmm. they, are, are they here for the long term? What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today, my guest is Alex Williams. He's the co-founder and COO of Create Music Group. Create Music Group is a distribution company, a publisher. They do YouTube royalty collection, rights management. They do TikTok influencer marketing through Flight House Media, which they acquired. And, and if you remember from my episode a couple of weeks ago, I had Austin Georges of Flight House Media talking all about TikTok influencer marketing campaigns. Create does a lot, and they were actually named by Inc. Magazine on their Inc. 5,000 fastest growth companies in America in 2020, named number two fastest growth company in America. Number two is Create Music Group. They have over 25,000 artists and 5,000 label clients, and they were the ones that distributed Takashi 6 9 single Trolls with Nicki Minaj, and it reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. This is the first time in history, I think, and this is what they say, these are the words, I haven't investigated or researched this enough and done this, but if you know otherwise, please let me know. They say (laughs) that this is the first time that a completely independent distributed single has ever reached the Billboard Hot 100 number one slot, not distributed by a major label, not a major label uh, overlord, not a subsidiary, completely independent distribution company. That's what Create is. And Takashi 69 Single Trolls hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Some of their numbers, they have 12 million monetized videos. This is this is what Create represents. Create Music Group artists get 11 billion monthly views. There's 2,500 record labels, 350,000 sound recordings, 100,000 compositions they represent and collect on. With Alex, we discuss release strategy and playlist pitching and how Create goes about working with their independent artists and how they're able to devote the time, energy, and resources for their artists. Specifically, they actually work with advances. They don't own any of their artist masters. They're independent. They're an independent distributor, but they're able to give advances. So he breaks that down and how that all works. He talks about their royalty collections and and how um, they were able to take some artists who had viral songs on YouTube that were making zero dollars from their YouTube royalties to making tens of thousands of dollars. He talks about how they went about that. And just he gives a lot of great advice on the best ways to release your music in 2021. As always, please follow, like, subscribe to this podcast. However you're listening to this right now, just hit that subscribe button, follow button, like, whatever it is, hit that button. And please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. That really, really helps. If you're listening on YouTube right now, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and leave us a comment. I would love to read it. You can find me at Ari Herstan on Instagram and Twitter. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Visit Ari'sTake.com. Sign up on that email list. That's where you're going to get the most up-to-date current information. All right, let's kick into the show. Alex Williams, welcome to the show. Oh my God, so glad to be here, Ari. Thank you. This is, so I'm, uh, so you, for people that are watching this right now, uh, we have to 
comment on this insane blue light this room that you're in right now oh i didn't your head was blocking that uh whatever that (laughs) this is that like some kind of sound uh panel thing so explain this room and where you are right now and then we'll get into this will be a nice segue but like i can't i can't really focus right now because i'm so entranced (laughs) uh by what's happening here so like step me through this right now so we're right now we're at uh, one of the five music studios here at Create Music Group, and uh, uh-huh. this is uh, <laughs> this particular room uh, and all the all the studios here were actually designed by uh, uh, Chris Bentley. And uh, you know, y- you might see like some studios of his around. He's done like Sean Kingston. He's done uh, Rick Ross. And he's oh. always working on a bunch of big studios. Um, yeah. You know, he he used to be one of the guys on. Uh, I always forget the name of the band, but it's uh, Bad Boys, Bad Boys. What you can Oh, be? yeah, sure. The Cops theme song. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, one of, <laughs> he's one of the members of that band, and he got into uh-huh. building studios, and we were like, hey, why don't you like design our whole office? Yeah. And um, wow, he just went to town. So he built this crazy thing. Um, so is I, this technically a recording studio, or is this your yeah. office right now? Okay, you're in a recording studio. Got <laughs> it's it. It's a right. recording studio, but when our in-house producer, Caesar is out of town, it is my office. You so. take it over. Fantastic. So <laughs> take over. very cool. Um, so, all right, Create Music Group, you're, you're technically the, the, uh, the chief operating officer, the COO of Create Music Group. Create Music Group was started not that long ago, I think, what, six years ago or so, 2015, um, and I mean, you guys had, I think I read somewhere a 47,000% growth rate in one year and Inc magazine rated you as the second fastest growing company in America and not to mention like the roster. And then you hit a number one hit, uh, no, billboard hot 100, one of the first, if not only, uh, completely independent distributors to get a number one song on the billboard hot 100. So You've been busy the last five, six years. Um, and I want to, that's just to preface all of this. This is like, you know, I pride myself on on um, knowing the independent distribution space very well. Obviously, my my digital distribution comparison, which Create is not on, well, we're going to talk about that. Um, I, this, this article is like, you know, I have gone into the depths of everything indie distributor. And I'm very curious at the create music model because uh it's kind of like you're a label hybrid it's kind of you have these label services and you're you've reached tremendous success you work with superstars you work with indie artists you work with independent labels all of that i want to take a full step back and give me what is the core mission right now of of create and and where are you right now uh, we can touch on the history a little bit later, but I'm I'm more interested in like what's going on right now with Create and and what your vision is as it stands. Absolutely. So you know, for us, it's it's definitely uh, it's been a very evolving story as the years have come along because mm-hmm. what we've seen is you know we started from the very beginning just kind of helping out people monetize their YouTube earnings, and then you know as these artists started getting bigger. We started seeing like, okay, how can we help these guys even more? And then we got more into the artist services side. Mm. And, you know, what we kind of realized along the way and what's going on now is we're realizing like, look, you can be somebody, uh, you know, you don't have to just go to the major label route. You could really, there is a path to make it from zero to a hundred and wherever we can help kind of uh, uh, bring those artists up to that space, we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, it, one of the main core missions was to create this, this middle class of artists, mm. which wasn't really ever recognized because, you know, it's either you were on one side of the fence yeah. as a writer, or you were on a major label deal and there wasn't really an in-between for such a long time. And now that that's starting to kind of show itself, we want to be able to have those services for those people. Um, mm-hmm. And also kind of empower these artists to create their own teams and not necessarily lean on, you know, big contracts that are essentially just kind of like 
terrible APR rates. If you think about it, it's just like, look, you can <laughs> make it on your own. And we're going to create those tools to make that happen. Yeah, um, the APR rate of eighty five percent is our uh, interest rate. So <laughs> we're going to take eighty five percent of all your money. I know. I look at the major label contract as like the worst loan in the history of loans of on um, you know on yeah. the face of the earth. It's crazy, but yeah. And, and it's like, look, if you're treating yourself like you are a, uh, a, a I guess you would call it a, 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 like a startup or, you know, you want to treat mm-hmm. your, your, yourself as an artist, kind of like a startup, then yeah, those big contracts will make sense if you're going to sell out the Staples Center and you want to go as big as you can. But most of sure. us are not going to do that. You know, it's, yeah. we want to, but, but most people are, are there's, there's only so many. And um, yeah, so mm-hmm. for us, that's kind of been a, a big mission of ours is, mm-hmm. is to create that stable middle-class economy of artists um, mm-hmm. that, you know, kind of bridge that gap between, look, you know, you either have to get a major label loan uh, because a bank won't give you a traditional loan because they don't right. recognize royalties like they yes. do a, uh, you know, a, a W-2. And so there's this middle part here that we want to fix for everybody mm. because it's very, you know, you, you, you have no choice. You have to go yep. to the, that deal that it's like, it's a bit- If you need all that money. money. Right, right, right. So, so yeah. break down the uh, create business model for- for me, uh, yeah. What do you do? Yeah, totally. So you know, for us, we we are we are at our heart, we are uh, a distributor. You know, okay. we we help monetize uh, mainly. Uh, we, we were very focused on YouTube, where it was a mm-hmm. huge, huge amount of royalties that people never really realized was there, mm. um, and that was a place that we really excelled at in the the EDM and the hip hop space, um, and now all the way up to artist services. You know, we will do big deals, long-term deals uh, with with bigger artists at a much much smaller fraction of the rate of, of something like a major. Um, and what you know, what is that rate these days? Do you have a set rate? Like, uh, you know, is this is this a rate like CD Baby takes nine percent, A Wall is typically taking fifteen percent, Stem now takes ten percent. Uh, what what does your deal look like? It really depends, but it could go anywhere between like. 15 to 20% all the way up to 35, 40. It really depends on how much an artist needs. Gotcha. Uh, and we try to we, we ca- try to build like an internal algorithm to say, hey, look, like if this artist needs this much money based on these rates per country, per streams coming in, how much mm. can I loan somebody and make sure that I don't put them in too much debt to where they're worried and they're going to hate me, but yeah. also, you know, that we're, we're making sure that they're going to be safe uh, they're going to be able to pay their bills. They're going to be able to excel and move mm-hmm. quickly on um, releasing music. Um, so yeah, so that's gotcha. That's kind of okay. Where it goes in between. Nice. So so okay. So you're your distributor, but you mentioned the loan, which I'm, I'm assuming that's like your advance, your version of of an advance. And now you have twenty five thousand artists, I believe. I read somewhere. Is that accurate at this point? Right. Yep. Okay. Um, I am. Uh, is every I'm assuming every artist is not treated equally in the sense that you get your 200 person staff uh, the full weight of them. I'm, I'm assuming the uh, Takashi Six Nine rollout of the single that went to number one on the Hot 100 is probably different in terms of resources and all of that than it is for one of these other artists. Um, give me that breakdown and, and, and do you have multiple tiers or how, how is that all structured internally? Absolutely. So yeah, we do have, we do have a, a, a kind of internal segment of tiers within the company okay. where, you know, you might just be somebody that just wants to put something out. Like you're saying, mm-hmm. you just want to put something out. You don't want anybody involved. Um, very simple. You just put it out lowest rate possible. You put, put it on DSPs. You're good to go. Sure. And then the next kind of rate where it starts going in there is it's like, you know, you have the label engine side of things, which is, mm. um, you know, run uh, typically an artist run independent record label. Well, they'll, re- they'll release multiple people, um, but they'll need, you know, uh, um, distribution services, promo services um, and accounting services. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest thing that we're, we're kind of experts on is uh, doing the accounting uh, internally with the very, very tech focused uh, stack that we have to make, make sure that's on, all done in a very automated fashion. So it's super mm-hmm. easy for, for anybody who's a record label owner just wants to distribute music. Mm-hmm. Then you get up to the bigger size, like you're saying, where you're talking about like the Takashi 6 9 um, mm-hmm. And you know, that's something where obviously if we want to make a big splash, it's not just putting out the song, it's making sure that we're firing on all cylinders. So that'll require a big team of people kind of going in there and making sure that everything from 
you know, the, the release stuff is lined up, making sure we're coordinating with the DSPs weeks in advance to let them know what's coming up, firing off all the promotional assets on the day of, um, mm-hmm. making sure that, you know, if the song is hitting at a certain trajectory that we're like, okay, this thing's going, you know, throw the gas on it. Let's keep yep. going because as I'm sure, you know, like anybody, you know, I, if people, people, uh, you know, like my age or your age or anything could listen to a song and say, Hey, that's awesome. But right. you know, teenagers might think it's the worst thing in the world. So I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm, I always say I'm the worst <laughs> A&R because if I like it, it's probably not going to do well. So, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, like yeah, right. jazz is not getting number one, but, uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but you know, so that's the thing is like, you know, we're very reactive on our data with those big teams and mm-hmm. that's where it's like, it, it, it definitely requires a higher input in terms of a percentage is because you do have mm-hmm. a big team ready to fire, but you also have that availability to say, Hey, look, if we need to throw a hundred three hundred thousand dollars at something because it's going and we know that path is gonna mm-hmm. keep going up cool we have that liquidity to do that we don't we can just do it right away are you structured more so i'm hearing that that uh a lot of the resources are held until something starts to react and then you jump on the train or is there anyone who comes in you're like wow we really believe in you like you said you're not the anr do you have anr people who bring people in or like you know what Come with us. Don't sign with Columbia. Here's three hundred thousand dollars. You know, this is we mean business. We believe in you. Do you have that as well, or is this pretty much reactive? So, so it, it, what what it's kind of been over the past six years is is you know we kind of started with that low hanging fruit, right? Like mm-hmm. YouTube. There were a bunch of EDM artists didn't know that you know their songs were everywhere. Help those guys out. Then we got into the rap game. Same thing. A lot of people didn't realize it. Then we started getting into like, okay, let's get some bigger acts that we know are are kind of more safe guarantees. Let's work with those guys, help them sure. out. So now we're six years into it, and we do have a roster of A and Rs that's bringing in a lot of young talent, and we're helping support those guys. Mm-hmm. Now I'll say that in order for us, because mantra wise, we really don't want to uh, go the same path as a major, in that we don't want to put. Uh, too many eggs in a basket when it comes to this kind of an approach, simply because, you know, we're still six years into it and we've had that crazy trajectory. Um, and we want to make sure that we're always staying true to uh, making sure that we're, we're able to grow our roster. So mm-hmm. we don't want to say, Hey, you know what? I believe you, I'm giving you a million dollars, $10 million, whatever. But right. I, 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 you know, it is a lot more likely to say, Hey, I believe in you. Mm-hmm. Let's give you somewhere in the range of, you know, zero to 250. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm, to get it mm-hmm. started, I would say the big difference that we are are kind of approaching is we're very, very tuned in with data. Uh, you know, our platform, the portal shows the clients what they make every single day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're able to do that from this really epic algorithm that we've developed in house that before even a Spotify or Apple Music pays us, I can determine within a relatively close accuracy of about almost 5%, Mm. how much you're going to make that month. That's great because our artists are able to release things faster. They're able to put stuff out or if something's not working, we're able to pull back right away from it. Um, So you pay them? Are you you basically giving these uh, instant micro advances based on what the streaming data is telling you even though the money is not in your bank account from the dsps correct so it's a two-part wow. approach so if we know that somebody's coming in from a history it's mm-hmm. much easier for us to give an advance because there's a sure. pipeline we know okay relatively safe they'll make this much mm-hmm. if someone's a newer artist and they start to grow right away we have that capacity to really throw the gas on it because we're so in tune with that data on a daily basis that it's like, hey, look, something's taken off. Um, you know, we'll we'll sit down with that artist and say, look, we can really just start going with this. We suggest throwing this much in on promo or whatever to really get this thing going. But mm. what we never ever want to do, um, because as you know, with every artist, it's true. Every artist says the same thing. They could do a great job, terrible job, anything. F the majors. Every single artist right. says the same <laughs> thing. They've never been on one. They've been on one they are on one it's always the same conversation right um, you know major suck it's like well you know they got a great side and yeah there's other sides of course but that's the one thing the one rapport we never want to develop with our artists is 
you know, oh, I put too much money into a song that didn't work. You know, mm-hmm, I never, mm-hmm. and I think artists nowadays are in tune enough to understand that it's like, you know, I, if, if something is not hitting, they know it's not hitting. We know it's not hitting. You can't throw more money into something if it's just not taken off. So thankfully having daily data really helps us keep on a really, really positive note with our artists, but also make sure that they're growing at a steady rate and making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, no one's in, in major debt at any point because mm-hmm. we're able to scale together. Amazing. And I, I love that you uh, earlier, you were mentioning middle class musicians and that you're excited about that. Now, you know, the majors are not interested in middle class musicians. That's not their business model. The majors right. business model is we are going to take 100 bets this year and two are going to work out for us. And the other 98, fuck them. They cut them loose. You know, their line items on our on our spreadsheets, their deductions, their expenses, essentially, for us. And we don't care about them, so we're going to cut them because we got the two. You know, we got Megan the Stallion and we got Justin Bieber, whatever. So uh, now you say that you're interested in, in the middle class musicians. You do take a commission. A commission. Um, now, how can you, um, I guess... Um, justify keeping an artist on who's pulling in 50,000 a year making a living but that's only uh, you know if you're if you're uh, taking 20% or something that's 10 grand i'm uh, are you able to devote much attention or time or resources into the middle class musicians as you are into the superstars who are funding you know the business just like nuts and bolts how that works Absolutely. So the way that we've, and and this is actually something that uh, we built within the company that was uh, somewhat controversial, was basically we, we, we looked at the structure of how we were operating in terms of label services. And we said, look, you know, I don't want us to be like every other label. I really mm-hmm. like, I really want to steer as clear away from that as I possibly can. And so one of the things that we kind of had to face uh, uh, was how do we structure it so that we're giving the most attention per artist? kind of like you would teachers in a classroom. It's probably one of the first things you get in a kid later and the kid's like, okay, how many, that's the first thing you ask the, the principal over. Okay, what's how many teachers per per child right. or whatever, right? Right. right. Yeah. Or how many children per teacher? Um, in the same way, I wanted to treat us uh, 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 in the same fashion. So one of the, the models that we actually worked with, which wasn't actually a music model, was actually a tech model. We worked with uh, uh, um, something, it's, it's the way that Spotify actually structures their teams. And so what we work on is like in Spotify, they have typically someone who's a leader of a team and then they'll have five or six people under that team. And then within those teams, each one of the people has a certain specialty and they meet with other people who have that same specialty. We did the same thing on our end where we said, look, you're going to be a a PM, a a product manager. And within there, um, you're going to have a certain set of clients so that we can make sure that we keep that class size small, so to speak. But mm-hmm. that class size is based on a certain mix. So you might have one PM that loves picking up their phone at 3 a.m. on a Sunday and can handle those, you know, 6 9 wants to put something out in 24 hours. Okay, that's my guy, you know. Right. I know Ryan, Ryan's my guy. Like, I know he's the guy. Right. So we're going we're gonna to structure more of those types of acts towards somebody like Ryan. But mm. he's going to have a makeup of uh, uh, several of those but he won't pass a certain capacity to where he's too overloaded. And so we have that PM structure where it's a PM. And then within the PM, you have about four to seven different people under that PM that have different specialties, whether it be distribution, promotion, um, uh, 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 digital rights, business affairs, everything. So we've essentially created all these little mini teams of people that actually know how to do everything. Whereas as as a traditional label, you have, your promo team, your marketing team. You have everybody kind of all separated. And the problem right. with that is, you know, when when a big act comes along, you don't really have somebody who's really owning that particular artist. Mm. It's more like all hands on deck for maybe two or 300 different acts. Uh, right. You know, our philosophy is more like, hey, look, you should probably have maybe, you know, depending on if you need the upfront people, maybe only 10 to 20 or 30 people um, if it's less, more laid back, like you're saying, the middle class person that 
they make 50 grand a year. It's not a lot of like really, it, they don't ask for too much. It's just, I just want to put out my music, get a good rate, distribute stores, collect my royalties each, each month. They might have more capacity. So that PM mm. might be able to handle a hundred of those types of people. Sure. So that's the idea is as you get kind of more segmented up into the higher, you know, call it multi-million streams, mm-hmm. you're going to have a lot more attention on focus or, or you're going to have a PM that's only focused on a few rather than many. Got it. Okay. Um, now, you know, every artist that comes in is going to want the full attention of the, in the full weight of create. Um, obviously, you know, that, that, doesn't uh, make business sense if they're not earning. I mean, we, I would say STEM learned that the hard way uh, mm-hmm. when they took on way too many artists. Uh, they were only taking 5% commission at the time, but they realized because there were no fees up front, all these artists who were not earning were demanding a lot of their time and attention. So they had to do, they had to pivot, make an about face, and basically cut loose a majority of their roster um and you know because they just the 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 numbers didn't make sense um your business model in this sense you say you'd like to support these middle class musicians but i I keep hitting this like like doesn't make business sense um i would love to see you know you be able to support all these middle class musicians um are you selective and exclusive at who comes on and if so what is the threshold who do you allow who do you work with totally so for us um you know a lot of that decision making is left on our team of a and r's so i I believe we have you know we have internal a and r's we have people outside that help bring talent over to us um but they're going to be the main deciders obviously i i you know we probably have an inbox here of of thousands of people just messaging and all that Mm -hmm. um But when it comes down to it, you know, we are looking for, uh, we are certainly selective um, in that, you know, we want to make sure that it doesn't even just come down to, does the person have like a hit? You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's more Mm -hmm. about, does the person have the longevity that they want to be in it? You know, and and that, those are the kinds of things we try to determine when not just working on with a new artist based on like, look, let me see your pipeline revenue from Spotify or whatever, just to determine you know, is this a one-time thing or are you, are you working, um, mm-hmm. all the way down to, you know, like is, is this person coming in, uh, who, who are the kind of people that come in the room with this person? Is it, mm-hmm. is it his team? Is it like videographer, manager? Is it all these people? Or is it just like, you know, a bunch of his friends? Like, I want right. to see how serious is this person? Because I need to make sure if we're going to be investing in something together that, you know, that person's head in, is in the game. And, Mm-hmm. I think that's the one defining factor that a lot of people try to kind of shy away from, but it's very much real as it's like, what's the character buildup of the person kind of coming into the room? Like, are mm-hmm. they, are, are they here for the long term? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we feel pretty good about it. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something where, you know, the, I, I could say that many, you know, many people who do apply probably don't get in just because they, we don't see that X factor, I guess you would say. Okay. Um, so we we definitely want to make sure that it's like if you're all the way down to like you're saying the middle class it's like you know are are you are you working hard are you always putting mm-hmm. stuff out or is it just one song that got put out a year ago and now you're asking me for a fifty hundred thousand dollar advance right probably I'm probably gonna be like uh well I don't know if this mm-hmm. is making mathematical sense I I want to sure. build with you you know together. Yeah. Um, so, so what, yeah. what is it? So let's say, uh, you believe in an artist, an artist comes in, uh, they don't have much history or maybe they've released a few singles they've done. Okay. But you really believe in this artist. Um, will, uh, how hands-on are you with these artists? How much are you helping them with a release strategy? How much are you going to bat for them with the DSPs or with PR or with, radio if you're doing any or any of this um or is it only based on your previous success i'm not going to talk to you unless you have a billion streams and then we'll sit down for a conversation (laughs) no not at all so uh for sure one of the things that we worked on that that we realized was as we were building out this structure for dsp pitching Mm -hmm. um was that exact problem you're talking about is how do i make sure i can service 
Takashi six nine, Tory Lanes, all the way down to you know the, the 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 guy just coming in. And one of the things we realized was the big issue that we had was the communication flow from the artist to uh, to our team up to the mm -hmm. DSP. So one of the biggest things we took on right away was we started setting kind of like quarterly deadlines within our teams, within our PMs to make sure that it's like, look, if you guys want this consideration, again, it's like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you're a, you're a six, nine or, or you're, you know, you're Bob down the street. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that you are adhering to these guidelines. So I need mm -hmm. you to return. You need to let me know by X date, typically, uh, uh, I believe we do about six weeks in advance mm -hmm. that you have a song that, that you believe is special. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, that person is invested in the track as much as we're invested in the track. Mm. So I'll have them kind of like put together, um, you know, uh, uh, marketing release strategy, things that, uh, uh, you know, w what is it about this song that we need to pay attention to it more than all your other songs so that we can pitch it to these DSPs. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the biggest things that we did notice when it came to DSP pitching was two factors really stood out for them and really helped with our success. Um, number one was the amount of time. And that was just a purely, you know, if, if you're only giving the DSPs one week, um, they're probably not going to play list. They're, they're not even going to look at you, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're giving them, you know, 28 plus days uh, and they have a good, they, they, they have the time to place it. Um, but also that, you know, you've worked with the artists and, and really, you know, worked with them to get, what is it about this song that's special? Where is it being promoted? Um, you know, is there a music video coming out? Like what's all these kind of marketing drivers have helped us a lot with those mm. placements. Um, and so, yeah, kind of setting up that pipeline was one of the big things that we realized like, Hey, we can, we can get it so that, you know, down to, uh, uh somebody who maybe only gets like, you know, tens of thousands to, uh, hundreds of thousands of streams a month can compete on that same level as, as the big, big guy, because mm -hmm. it's really more about process. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, as long as you guys are following these best practices, you're going to increase your odds. And, um, that, that was one of the big things that we really realized over this past year was such a huge turning stone for helping out those guys that may not be as recognized as the big people. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk playlist pitching. Um, because mm -hmm. this is the thing that, you know, Spotify likes to say, uh, like two years ago that they've put up this, this, uh, iron wall and that distributors can't get to them anymore. And that's why they created their backend Spotify for artists, you know, direct pitching tool where any artist can log in and, and pitch. And, you know, uh, you mentioned the things, this is what Spotify likes to hear. Do you have a music video coming out? What's your promotional plan? Spotify gives us, gives the artist, you know, 500 characters basically to type all that in there. And mm -hmm. I, when I release music, I'm like, I don't know what they want from me. Like, <laughs> I got an American songwriter write-up. Do they care about that? Do they want to hear the backstory, how I wrote about my my ex? Do they want it? Like, I have no idea because I'm trying to figure this out on my own. I'm sure every other artist is like, is there a secret here? And and are you actually talking to people at Spotify? And what's the success rate that you're seeing? So with us, the biggest thing I think that moved the needle, I believe, was consistency. Um when it came to newer artists, yeah, they definitely don't have as, I guess you would say as, as in the very beginning, they don't have the same chance. Um, but after being consistent about it, like you're releasing something every three to four weeks or something, mm -hmm. we notice that they start to pay attention to these guys. Um, probably because my assumption is that your follower count is probably gradually growing as you're putting out new, new music. Mm -hmm. Um, but for us, it was really, it, it it's crazy because, and, and I, it was so funny to me because like going into this, I never realized how late people would always turn in music. Like, mm. and I mean, insanely late. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't want to pick on, you know, a particular genre, but definitely I would think that, uh, you know, hip hop always came in kind of at the midnight hour huh. versus EDM. I think those guys were a little, little better. At, at mm. kind of doing it several weeks, but I wouldn't say drastically better, but sure. it, it was always this kind of thing where I think it was more of an artist education thing. I, I really think they don't understand the importance mm. of if you have a song ready to go. I think every young artist's initial thought is hell. Yeah. 
let's put this out right effing now. Yeah. And that 100% is the wrong move. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Like it's, it's just, we've, it's taken us years to, to like, I guess you would say like, uh, uh, ingrain this thing into our mm-hmm. mantra, but like really having, like having a plan mm-hmm. for at least 30 days out mm-hmm. is so important. Um, because you know what, if you want to put that thing out right now, you're so excited. What if you wake up tomorrow and you don't feel the same way? Mm-hmm. And I think that's what a lot of things people don't realize is like, you know, the weekend might put out an Epic album of 12, 13 songs. But what you don't hear is there's a, probably a hundred plus other songs that he cut that were probably just as amazing, mm-hmm. but he, he waited, you know, he, yeah. he thought about it and those hundred mm-hmm. did not make the cut. And, um, I think artists need to look at, they need to look at their plan the same way is, um, you need to, you need to kind of look in, I guess, from an outside view as, right. is this really something special that is going to stand out that, you know, like you should be able to show all your friends that, and they should be like, yo, this is awesome. But mm-hmm. if they don't say that, you know, it, it's probably, so, so a, is, is a waiting, problem. is waiting solely for, uh, just to give you to to only release the best of the best and not to put because I, I'm hearing conflicting things. One, it's like put out a song every three to four weeks. Spotify loves that, but you should also wait and don't put out everything because you may create a lot, but if you put out shit, that's gonna look really bad. So only put out the good stuff, but don't put it out too quick. But you got to put it out every three to four weeks because that's what Spotify wants. So like, what is it? <laughs> So here's here's the fun secret, and that's the best one out of all of it. <laughs> you know, right now your favorite artists in the entire world who are the chart topping best people are probably in a studio right now. They're probably mm-hmm. in a studio and they're probably working an exhausting amount of time every single day. Mm-hmm. And that's the truth. If you're looking at a competitive landscape of who you're going up against, that's it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like mm-hmm. you're going up against people that literally live and breathe this. And that's what I want to. I want people to understand is is you have to be in that mindset that you're able to produce multiple songs a day, mm. but you also need to be consistent because places like you know, for example, YouTube. Our best place content on all the channels we have on YouTube are the ones that treat it like a TV show. Mm. You know, every Monday here, every Monday I put something out at the same time. You know, like Ari's take, I put something yeah. out. At the same time, every right, time, right. <laughs> people are are programmed for programming. Sure, and and so especially when it comes to music, it's this new thing that we've started doing, where it's like Spotify, uh, uh, Apple Music, all of them. Remember, they treat their platforms in the same kind of algorithmic fashion that a YouTube mm-hmm. does. So you want to create a sense of normalcy that it's like every mm-hmm. couple of weeks or something, you're dropping a new song. Mm. And so it's it, so it kind of shows you, but you're right. It's at the same time you also want to be putting out consistently all these things, but you want to be putting out the best. So it does show you that there is this middle ground that you need to be working and working and working. Don't just make it about one song. If you got one song, you better have three more lined up. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. it's kind of like this process of get together music and get enough content so that you can plan out the next several months of like I'm going to drop this song. The next next three or four weeks, I'm gonna drop this one, then this one, then this one. Mm-hmm. If you only have one song, I would say that you're probably not at that stage yet where mm-hmm. um, you know, that should be step one. Like get sure. a solid, solid couple of songs under you so that you can start mm-hmm. planning it out with the biggest piece. So you mentioned the uh get a plan. You keep talking about this this plan and and you want to, you know, the you want your artist to send you a song at least 30 days out so you can have this plan. Now, how much um how much goes into the release plan that happens before release day and how much happens after release day? So, going into it before release day, um, I would say you have about a 30 day schedule before release day where it's like, look, we know this thing's coming out. Mm-hmm. It's coming out on this week. Um, so what are we going to want to line up? Uh, we're going to want to line up, uh, uh, everything from making meme campaigns, even on Instagram mm-hmm. to, you know, running, running ads, whether it be on, uh, um, YouTube true view ads, whether it be us, um, working with, uh, for example, like Facebook, um, IG 
ads, the swipe mm-hmm. up ads, mm-hmm. you really, you know, I always say the one funny thing is like, you know, if you have a lemonade stand in your neighborhood and, you know, you're killing it, like your neighbors love your lemonade, you have two options. You can either wait for word of mouth to happen, um, which is a much slower, longer process. Or, you know, you, you put up banners everywhere, letting everyone know in the surrounding neighborhoods, I got, you know, epic lemonade. Sure. And that's kind of that decision you got to make. Um, so, so going into this, you know, we'll, we'll try to, we'll try to spend, we'll try to do like a, a spend having to do with all the different advertising on a base level mm-hmm. and then release day. That's the important day because, mm-hmm. you know, there was a, 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 when we saw Gooba take off with uh six, nine, it was like unprecedented how high, you know, I don't think anybody would have predicted how high, how big it would have gone. That was the number one hip hop release on all of YouTube in a 24 hour mm-hmm. period. So at that point, now you're talking post release. Okay, YouTube's working. Put more money into YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know these ads are working. Put more money into ads. People are are obviously making a lot of funny memes and jokes about it and everything. So we're like, okay, let's let's put money into that. Make sure that more people that may have not heard about it but maybe saw a picture really get ingrained into what's mm-hmm. going on. Uh, I think they say it takes like eight times or something for you to hear a song before it's like catchy and it's in your head. Uh So if I got to expose somebody eight times to a piece of content, (laughs) I got to figure out some creative ways to do it. Um, So, you know, that's, that's kind of the mix, but it's really on release day Mm. that you, you're going to kind of see, because what happens if, you know, the expectation is, is a, you know, what if it's a flop at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. like you have to look at that side too. What if it's just acting? Well, how much does release day actually matter? Because honestly, we we have so many songs that we see uh, don't quite catch or pop off until a year later, sometimes yeah. even longer. So like I, I push back a little bit on the if it doesn't pop on release day, it's a flop because I think especially for indie artists, you're not going to see that kind of, you know, they don't. Indie artists don't have a hundred thousand dollars to put into ads and, and influencer campaigns on release day. So, mm-hmm. what are what is the like more realistic expectations of you know post uh, release and 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 is a song old and like you know twenty four hours after its release and we shouldn't think about it anymore. <laughs> um, so with that with that kind of side of things, it's very interesting because. There are songs that end up, you know, kind of growing over time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the best, best examples that we can use that is TikTok. Mm-hmm. You know, TikTok will, will repackage songs in a way that's never happened in history. And um, because of that platform, we're able to see um, this kind of, this really interesting growth on our side because we'll be able to tap into uh, um, our distribution data that tells us, hey, look, um, you know, this particular song uh, which has a kind of a slower up, up, uh, uh, upwards growth mm-hmm. is being shazammed all of a sudden an insane amount of times. And obviously, mm-hmm. you know, Shazam's owned by Apple, so we can see that stuff. Mm-hmm. So when we see stuff like that, it's like, okay, something's happening here. Something mm-hmm. that, like you're saying, may have taken a little longer term. Um, but when those things happen, it's great because we're going we're gonna to reach out to the artists. We're going to say, look, let's, let us uh, support you. Let's figure out how we can do this, kind of grow it as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely it's one of those things where, you know, sadly, for, for, for the, uh, I guess you would say, the, for the, the, the smaller artists, mm-hmm. it is something that it, it's, I guess it's not as, uh, uh, if you were to look at how many things get released versus how many actually get that longer tail, mm-hmm. you know, they have, they have an upward battle to, to, to kind of fight, if that makes sure. sense. It's not as, uh, it's not as quick. And mm-hmm. so that is kind of the issue is when you're looking at a song long term mm-hmm. and you're looking at things investment wise, um, you know, it's hard to say, hey, I'm going to put my money into this thing, but it might pay back in a year right. when you're dealing with such a grand quantity of other songs that might be on that same like trajectory in terms sure. of like, you know, oh, you went from 100 plays a day to maybe a month or two later, a thousand plays a day. It's very hard to predict. Um, yeah. you know, Hey, is this thing going to keep going? So as soon as we do identify those though, you know, we, we try to reach out right away to those guys and say, see like, Hey, look, we think something, something's happening here. Something's starting. Um, you know, how do we kind of push this from here? 
So I want to go back to th this plan that you're talking about just to get some clarity because you're saying the 30 days leading up to it, you're going to get all the ads together. You're going to start running ads. But uh, just nitty gritty specifically, how are you running ads on songs that aren't released yet? So what we'll do is we'll, we'll we line up all the campaigns. So typically, okay, a lot of these things are they they give, they have music videos attached to them. Okay, um, that's probably one of the biggest things that we always you know tell our clients is like do a music video, even if it's a visualizer or anything like create that type of a content because you know while some people are audio listeners, some people might be visual, and it's like mm -hmm. you don't want to you don't want to remove yourself from that segment of audience. Mm. Um, you know, you do you release the music video before the song comes out or do, after the song comes out? We typically do it at the same time. Okay, same day. Yeah, we we'll typically so, do it the same day. So am I, under, am I hearing you correctly? All this prep work, the 30-day plan, you're not actually putting anything publicly out. You just have stuff to do every day, like get a music video together, get these ads together, get all of this. So then on release day, you open the floodgates and then all the stuff pours out, so you're just prepped and ready for release day. Is that is that correct? Right. Yeah. Got it. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So that makes sense. Um, where does PR fall into this? Do you think that uh, press is um, as relevant these days? Do you guys even focus on it? Do you have a PR department that helps your artists? So when it comes to PR, interestingly enough, a lot of our artists enjoy using kind of like their people. Everybody, yeah. you know, from, from from the artists that are definitely kind of like in that mid tier, we do mm -hmm. notice that that is kind of a, a trend that we're seeing a lot. That it's like, you know, hey, I got my guy. He helps me out. He would talk to all these blogs, all that. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, when it comes to, to to, we try to work with what the artist preference is. Sure. Um, when it comes to PR in general, like one of the most effective that we see is uh, uh, digital. So like having to do with, excuse me, uh, Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, Stuff like that really works well. The traditional uh, uh, PR uh, route, I guess you would say, like um, um, music blog, stuff like that. Right. We haven't really seen as as traditional of a, 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 a kind of a one to one blend. Like you know, if uh, it doesn't move the needle uh, anymore, uh, like it did in the hype yeah, machine it doesn't really age. Move the needle. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I I attribute that to generally just kind of like the I guess we call it like the death of the web page. Like no one's yeah. really. Don't go to web pages anymore is you go to apps you know you go yep. to instagram you go to tiktok um and if that's you know if i was to look at my phone right now look at my productivity and you know, i'm looking at two or three hours of instagram consumption a day mm -hmm. you know like i think that's that's kind of a uh, maybe for a younger person it's two or three hours of tiktok i don't know but right the point is like if that's where you have eight hours a day and you're spending it you know, mm -hmm. like kind of looking at that, then those are the signs. Like, mm -hmm. go towards that. Like, use mm -hmm. that as your your first. Like, that's stop number one. Okay, mm -hmm. more people look at TikTok. Okay, how do I? So how do I kind of get it on? TikTok? Yeah. So, so I'm assuming when you're saying focus on Instagram, we're gonna put some money there. Focus on TikTok. I'm assuming you're referencing influencer campaigns. Yeah. So you can work with influencer campaigns. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these younger artists are really good friends with people like academics or or friends like, uh, um, ah, what's his name? Um, I forgot his name, but um, you know, uh, or the wrap up page or you know, Six mm -hmm. Buzz if you, if you're mm -hmm. one of the producers from Canada, and like you know, this is kind of like those guys are those new age influencers sure. that it's like you know mm -hmm. you want you want to kind of get into those crowds because they're gotcha. gonna have that ability. Mm -hmm to just really expose you to a large audience that's more mm -hmm. focused on the kind of niche genre you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Cause that's where your, your core fans are really going to be mm -hmm. is, um, you know, if you're, if you're hip hop or rap, then absolutely everyone's following academics. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So mm -hmm. if you can get in there, it's, it's a, it's a, a faster form of validation mm -hmm. than, you know, being, um, being written on by like, you know, hype machine or something. You know I mean? Right. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I just had Austin Georges of Flight House on the on the show, and, and yeah. I know that Create owns uh, you acquired Flight House, um, which mm -hmm. for people that haven't heard that episode, go listen to it. Flight House is the number one music channel on TikTok. They run a whole TikTok influencer uh, influencer marketing company essentially, and and they yep. kind of work out really creative campaigns. Um, to help songs catch on TikTok. Um, 
when it comes to uh, your budget of, let's say, your marketing budget for a song that you're you're focusing on, could you give me a rough percentage breakdown of how much money is being spent on these avenues that we've now touched on or that that you do as as create? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely I'm glad you brought up Flight House because that's that's what <laughs> that was probably one of the big ones I was going to uh, uh, jump on. But sure. definitely, um, you know. When you, when you get into that kind of avenue, I would argue that you're looking at, I would say, I'll do a rough estimate, probably in, in general advertising for the music video, um, we're going to try to push, I would say, I would say Instagram and YouTube is going to be Instagram and Facebook ads as well as YouTube advertising is going to be a pretty pretty large upfront cost of it. A pretty, uh, I would say maybe, oh, it's a tough one. If we're talking just promo costs, mm-hmm. I would say like maybe 40, 50% of it. Okay. I'm trying to think. Um, definitely utilizing Flight House is going to be a big, mm-hmm. big part of it as well uh, because... Okay. You know, like they've worked with, uh, you know, like Sunday Best by Surfaces. Um, mm-hmm. y- you know, so it, when something hits, it's, you know, it's going to hit. It, they did so Arizona Service, that, you know, uh, Roxanne, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yep. exactly. So, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, 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 I would say probably 10, 15% of the budget towards uh, TikTok advertising, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say, and then outside of those, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think like, you know, if something's big enough, we'll, we'll, we can do like billboard stuff, but we don't really do that as much. Sure. Um, that's more of a, uh, it's, it's more, I guess you would say kind of like, you know, d- the artists love it, right? you know, right. obviously it's like they're on a billboard, yeah. but will it push <laughs> the needle? Probably sure. not as much. It's more about yeah. the guy being able to post that he had a billboard behind him, which is, it's, it's a big form of validity for that person's audience. So, you know, people sharing that does make an effect, um, but not as big as the digital advertising portion of it. Um, so I would say, yeah, most of it goes into digital advertising. Yeah. Are you doing any, um, any user generated playlist, uh, pitching or any kind of campaigns there? We don't really work as much with those the third party playlists. Um, mm-hmm. For us, uh, you know, we really try to f- focus heavily on making sure that we get on the official playlist for Spotify sure. and Apple Music because uh, mm-hmm. that's what we just noticed really moves the needle. Sure. Um, and YouTube Music as well. They they've been YouTube Music has been such a great partner. Um, mm-hmm. I feel yeah. like they're they're very uh, they're very uh, under underappreciated they really really do a good job of uh and you know they're really trying to compete on the same level as uh, spotify and apple music sure and um they definitely do uh, uh give us a really really uh, uh, strong hand when it comes to getting our, our music featured in their official weekly playlist mm. um so they're, that, that's a definitely a big source for pitching as well Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we don't really work as much. I, I think we will do certain certain campaigns just to test them out. Um, but typically, we don't really see too much of the needle moved on on those uh, those third party playlists. Got it. All right, so so we we still have thirty to forty percent of our budget unaccounted for here. Uh, we have, we got fifty percent on on ads and and ten to fifteen percent on on TikTok stuff. Um, I'm curious, what is it? Is the rest in in just like kind of the content creation, you're paying for graphic designers, you're paying for the music video, you're just kind of, yeah. uh, th- that's where it goes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm we, just, I'm, yeah, wondering if there's like, what's the secret here? Like, what what are you spending on that I haven't heard of yet? <laughs> no, no, you're right. It's a uh, music video cost generally. Yeah. Um, you know, some artists are incredibly creative and, and, you know, obviously, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the six, nine videos. Those are, uh, those are those are expensive, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but but you know it's like it, we have so much fun with them, and and it's sure. typically so much chaos. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I don't think I've ever experienced so much chaos uh, uh, coming up to a release. But you know, it, it, it it's definitely something that the point of it is to th- turn your head, you know, sure. and to just look like he did what, you know. It's it's yeah, yeah. it's definitely like 
<laughs> we moved the needle on that at least. It's uh, crazy. Yeah, one. totally. Um, um, okay. And uh, so I, I wanted to touch on um, briefly, uh, where was it? So with your... Um, um, yeah, so we've talked about the kind of uh, the lifespan of the song and the middle class musician and and kind of how it's not. Uh, yes, there's this plan that really needs to happen before uh, release day. Um, but then there's the longevity that comes after that. Are there any recommendations you can give to artists? Let's say a month after their song has been released, they've done the plan. Uh, to keep the momentum going, maybe they didn't get the response I, I, that they were hoping for. And I, I think, you know, a lot of artists feel this way oh, when they release a song. They never they never get the response they're hoping for. They never get the uh, the the six nine uh, explosion, you know, uh, when the song comes out. So what's like what is your advice to them once it's like yeah they spent the last you know two years writing a hundred songs and they finally narrowed it down to the best 10 they made this incredible plan and now they release it and they didn't get on any playlists so their life is over like what is your advice to them when like spotify is not giving them the love uh my best piece of advice would be to uh, um the biggest thing is again consistency but also um I believe networking is incredibly important. It's like one of those things that I think a lot of artists shy away from uh, just because what do you mean it by is networking? a crap. I think that there is a lot of knowledge out there that maybe, you know, I, I see it, I would say I see it more on the EDM side than I would on the hip hop side. Hip hop okay. side is definitely built of groups of a lot of people that know each other. Mm -hmm. But EDM people are typically more like, you know, I'm here in my crazy studio and nobody bother me mm -hmm. kind of group. And, and, you know, for the most part, the ones that I do kind of see getting more into success are comfortable with building teams and with like, you know, having those people uh, uh, and taking chances on those people around you to kind of like get to that next stage. Sure. Um, if it doesn't hit, keep going, you know, just just keep going because something will. And when mm. it does, you we'll need to analyze your data. Was it was it a large female demographic, male demographic? What's their age range? How do you level with them? How do you speak with them? Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of kind of things we noticed historically that really helped us really understand data a lot better was like, you know, when it came to, you know, even Logan Paul, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. this guy is the the biggest, you know? And and mm -hmm. if you really kind of look at his history before the, the past kind of year or two, it's like, what did he do differently? Mm -hmm. It was actually very simple. He made a vlog every single day, every day. Wow. Would, mm -hmm. He never missed a day ever for for what you know four or five plus years mm -hmm. like that takes a pretty considerable amount of dedication mm -hmm. um but I, you know it people caught on it's like okay it, it caught on and it, it's it's that kind of like in fairness <laughs> there's very little filter with logan paul and by <laughs> releasing <laughs> amongst other things <laughs> but, but by releasing something every day i don't know if that's necessarily <laughs> the best recommendation in retrospect <laughs> he might even say the same thing he releases it out and then you realize that that yeah, probably yeah. No shouldn't filter. have posted Definitely. him going into the suicide forest, forest in japan i got it right probably but not the best probably not point the best. point <laughs> made it's the consistency and it's the it's the growth and it and you stay the course i i i, I get the, the yeah. point with it yeah i think yeah. The, the biggest thing they should do is take themselves out of their shoes and put it in the the the, the shoes of their fan their fan hmm. they want to be they want to not see you at your best i mean they do but they want to be on the journey that's why they're your mm -hmm. fan you know what i mean like mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. clicked on that like page because they see something in you yes and they, they love to be a part of that journey and they will pay to be a part of that journey. Mm -hmm. And once you have enough of those people, you know, it becomes easier. It becomes mm -hmm. easier over time, but you need to find your audience or excuse me, you need to let your audience find you. And that mm -hmm. takes time and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of, of mistakes and, you know, fail upward. You know, that's, that's what, how we <laughs> built this company. That's how everything's built. You just fail over and over and over again until you figure it out. Yeah, and, um, that's great. You know, it, it all kind of comes together. Yeah. That's that's great advice. That, <laughs> so, yeah, no, that, fail that, forward. That's probably 
<laughs> fail forward. I dig that. <laughs> I'm going to get that T-shirt. Um, cool. There we go. Uh, nice. Well, well, Alex, this has been so helpful, uh, very illuminating. And uh, it's just there, there's I have a three pages worth of stuff I wanted to talk to you about with create because you're doing so many incredible things there. Um, and we didn't get to touch on on a lot of that. But uh, I thought it was a very illuminating conversation. Um, I have one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Um, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Um, I think what it means is to be able to have a steady monthly income um, that's reliable, that uh, you know you, that 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 you can. I guess the best way to put it is that you you can have a monthly income stream that you're not you don't have somebody waving a big contract above your head that you're fearful of losing it all. I think when that happens, like, I think you can consider that you've made it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're able to pay your bills, you're able to grow, whether it be quickly or slowly. But just to see that growth every single month and to smile at it, I think that's, that's the definition. You know, it doesn't matter how many zeros are in that account. It's, it's to know that every month it's getting a little bigger or a lot bigger. But I mm -hmm. think having that reflection in each month and knowing that you can pay for your bills and feel good about it. I think that's, that's, that's my definition of making it. Love it. Alex Williams, thank you so much. It's been great. 